Thank you everyone for joining us today, uh, mostly virtual, <laughs> but, uh, but really excited to uh, speak with you all about the uh, Fulbright US Student Program, specifically the uh, Academic Awards. Uh, it's one of my favorite fellowships that both the Office of National Fellowships and the Office of Graduate Fellowships and Awards works with because it's one of the most malleable fellowships uh, to, to every student that applies. Uh, so every student comes to Fulbright for different reasons. It operates in over 160 different countries. And specifically, specifically with the academic grants, uh, it can just be from so many di different academic disciplines that no uh, two Fulbrights are the same. Um, and so uh, today we're going to talk a little bit, I mean, I'm going to go over with you, if I can get this to change the slide. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, let's try this again. Maybe the battery on this is there. Um, well, looks like we are going annual. Oh, nope, okay, now it works. Uh, okay, anyways, sorry for that brief blip. Um, but uh, so today we're gonna be going over all of the uh, details regarding the Academic Fulbright Awards, all of the components that uh, you're going to need to submit and that uh, both OGFA and ONF will support you through. Uh, also gonna highlight a few uh, students that I've worked uh, with in the past, just to kind of give you an idea for how specifically undergraduates, but there's a lot of transfer, uh, transferability for graduate students, but how those students have navigated this application in the past. We're gonna go over some of our internal deadlines. Um, so Fulbright is one of those fellowships that if you're an enrolled student uh, at FSU or an alumnus, that's fine. Uh, but if you're an enrolled student, you need to apply through our internal process uh, because I can tell you if you don't, that looks a little wonky to review committees if you're an enrolled student and you didn't go through your uh, university. Um, but anyways, we can talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, so we're going to highlight how our offices will work with you and then um, always like leaving a little extra time at the end of this presentation or any Fulbright presentation for questions, uh, just to talk to you specifically about your interests or, or if I can answer any questions about the countries that you're wanting to apply to, I'd be happy to do so as well. Um, I am not going to read this slide to you. Uh, the reason that it's in this presentation is uh, that from Fulbright's inception, and this is always important to remember, but from its inception, uh, this, this program was created to, to foster mutual peace and understanding between the United States and other countries. Uh, and that is, that is still to this day, that is the main priority of any Fulbright Fellowship. So whether you're applying for the academic awards all the way to the English teaching assistantships, First and foremost, Fulbright wants to see how are you building uh, that, that, that mutual peace and understanding? How are you engaging with the culture and the place and the people? Uh, usually that is going to be in some ways through your research or through your project, but Fulbright is always wanting to see how are you going above and beyond that uh, to, to learn about the people, the community and that place. Um, and so uh, this is funded by the US State Department. Uh, and it's for students uh, anywhere from uh, rising seniors uh, to students that are in their doctoral programs and anywhere in between. Uh, and so to be eligible for this fellowship, you just need to not have a terminal degree yet. Uh, and so for the majority of students that we're working with, that's not an issue. But if you are a doctoral candidate, that's something that you can talk to Agfa about. Um, but like I already said, first and foremost, wherever you're going, Fulbright wants to see how are you building that mutual peace and understanding. Uh, just to briefly go over the eligibility. Um, so you, you do need to be a U.S. citizen to be eligible, um, and you need to have your bachelor's degree in hand uh, by the time that you would start your fellowship. And so uh, if you are currently a rising senior, if you're graduating, say, next spring, that's absolutely fine. We're going to go over the timeline a little bit later in this presentation, but more or less, any Fulbright applicant that's going through our process is going to be submitting their application a full year, um, maybe even close to a year and a half ahead of when they would start their Fulbright. Um, and so if you plan ahead, whether you're about to graduate with your uh, undergraduate degree or if you're uh, in the midst of a master's program or PhD, we can, we can work on that timeline with you. Uh, every country is going to have different requirements, uh, some, a lot of similarities, but different requirements for what you or, uh, what threshold you need to be, to, uh, I'm sorry, what threshold you need to meet to be eligible for that country. Uh, one of the major criteria is language proficiency that can range 
dependent on country, dependent on specific fellowship in that country, uh, anywhere from beginner to intermediate to advanced. I'll go ahead and tell you that even for um, uh, research projects or academic projects, who the nature of that project inherently requires advanced proficiency, even if it's only intermediate that's required by the country, uh, you're going to need to show uh, how you're going to meet that higher threshold. Not to, if it's not just through your own proficiency, uh, through other resources at the university that you plan to go to or with the organization you plan to work with, uh, whether that's through interpreters or, or, or the like, uh, but how are you going to meet that threshold to make sure that your project is done well? Uh, and the last bullet point, this is something we can always talk about in a one on one meeting or just, you know, case by case situation, um, but you do need to um, submit a satisfactory uh, medical certificate from your position to make sure that you meet the health requirements uh, to participate in the Fulbright. Uh, so just kind of to, to go over the uh, uh, the quick and dirty of the, the Fulbright is it will, so it's going to cover all of your travel expenses to and from country. It's going to cover uh, your health insurance. They're going to cover your cost of living. Uh, that can range anywhere from uh, an apartment that they will find for you to living with a host family. And they're also going to uh, provide you with a monthly stipend. Uh, and so I usually will tell students that you're not going to be living lavishly through a Fulbright, but you're not going to be going without. So they'll make sure that they do take care of you. Um, you know, we all work in education, so I feel like we can we can at least understand that. Um, and so uh, Fulbright operates in over 160 different countries worldwide. Uh, and they're usually anywhere from 8 to 12 months uh, for the academic grants. And so that's always important to remember because uh, Feasibility is usually the one word that I constantly reiterate with my students that I'm working with is whatever your pro I, I, I care less what your project is and I care more that it's able to be completed in the time that Fulbright gives you. And so uh, when you're looking at your research projects, make sure that you can at least, even if it's just a very specific aspect of your research that you're looking into, that from the time that you arrive, it, alongside with your affiliates and partners in country, that you'll be able to do exactly what you say you're going to do. And so uh, with the academic grants, uh, it, they essentially exist on a spectrum. And what I mean by that is at one end of the spectrum, uh, there are Fulbright awards that are purely research and just research. You are not pursuing a graduate degree. You are there to conduct research with the affiliates that you name. On the other end of that spectrum, is there are academic grants that are purely graduate degree enrollment, either for a one-year master's degree or the first year of a multi-year master's or a multi-year PhD program. And then right in the middle, uh, there are Fulbright awards that do allow you to pursue a graduate degree. Uh, and if part of that degree is a, a thesis project or some sort of research component, then they do exist somewhere in the middle. And so when you are considering what is the best country and the best Fulbright award for you, Make sure that under, uh, so whenever, whatever country you click on, uh, and maybe at the end of this presentation too, I can just pull up the website and kind of quickly, you know, show that to you all as well. Uh, but when you click on the country and you click on the specific award that you want to apply to, usually somewhere in the middle of that page, it'll have uh, two bullet points and it's going to tell you yes or no, whether they're academic grants, uh, except research projects or graduate degree enrollment. Um, and if it's yes to both, then you have that full spectrum that you're eligible for. If it's only graduate degree enrollment, then it, unfortunately you have to be a part of a program. Um, but again, we can get into some of the nitty gritty of that uh, in a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Just really want to emphasize that these uh, these projects vary by country, um, but they do cover that spectrum, just not always fully. Okay, uh, so a couple students uh, to uh, just briefly talk with y'all about just to kind of show you how they navigated this process. Um, and for graduate students, I know this is going to be a little different. I uh, predominantly work with undergraduate students, so that's going to be the two examples that I provide. Uh, but I, work, I started working with Eli uh, leading up to the shutdown uh, in, in spring of 2020. Um, and so throughout the application process, um, Eli was a little bit flexible. His background um, in, in coral reef research, he had an extensive experience uh, down on, uh, on the uh, Gulf Coast of Florida, also had international experience at Honduras uh, in a couple of the locations. And so when he, was, uh, when he was coming to Fulbright, he didn't initially know that the Philippines was the best fit for him. He was considering a few coastal communities. 
Uh, but uh, as he was going through the process early on and reaching out to potential affiliates, everything just started to make sense uh, for, for the Philippines being the best location for him to build upon his research. And so for undergraduate students specifically, uh, so, so Eli happened to participate in an IDEA grant, which is run through the Center for Undergraduate Research and Academic Engagement. If you're not involved with that office, I highly encourage you to do so. Um, but I've also worked with students that have been a part of the Social Science Scholars Program, that have been a part of the um, Global Scholars Program, uh, or that have done things in their time at FSU uh, that, you know, maybe with the assistance of Fulbright and the assistance of uh, some additional funding, they could really take that project and really run with it. So don't think that you necessarily need to come to Fulbright with an entirely novel idea. If, if, if you do, that's excellent. Um, but uh, for Eli's case, uh, he was able to look at the research that he had done with coral reef restoration. Uh, and after building connections with his affiliate in the Philippines, they were able to establish that line of communication for the affiliate to say, we really like the work that you have been doing. We actually have this longstanding project that we've already been years into but we see this is how your research could adapt to our research. And so if you're willing to be a little bit flexible, you could join our project. This could be your responsibility. And so, uh, so the, what Eli ultimately settled on was a research project that wasn't 100% his idea initially, but uh, met somewhere in the middle. Uh, and was still going to be an amazing project for him to participate in to learn how the Philippines was navigating their coral reef restoration efforts and then bring that information back to his future graduate study in the United States which really emphasizes, again, um, that, that, that exchange between countries. Um, and so, unfortunately, and, and this is a point that I want to make both with, with Eli, the next student that I talk about, and just in general with the Fulbright program, is that uh, for, for any student that I'm working with, uh, from the students who I believe are going to the most competitive, the highest chances of being selected, to students who I think are going to really grow from this process, but are applying to a very competitive destination, I always tell them that the, the goal uh, should never be exclusively Fulbright, that if you're just putting all of your eggs into one Fulbright basket, you're going to be disappointed. And that's just because it is a, it's a competitive opportunity. And so Fulbright should always be part of the bigger uh, picture. And so in Eli's case, uh, I mean, obviously we didn't anticipate the pandemic. Uh, and so although he received his Fulbright uh, in 2020. Uh, he was able to postpone his project for a year and, and really try to make this happen. Um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, had to turn down the Fulbright Fellowship, but then use that experience, use that, uh, the, the research he was going to do as leverage to return to Honduras and continue his research there uh, in Utila. And so uh, it, at the end of the day, it's, uh, uh, it's, it was disappointing that uh, for reasons beyond Eli's control, he wasn't able to participate in the Fulbright program, but was still able to use the process and the, all the materials he developed, the essays he wrote uh, to reapply for other positions. Um, and that kind of is, uh, is a good segue into uh, Charles, who I worked with a few years ago. Um, but Charles, uh, when he came to the Fulbright program, so he was looking specifically for a, a, a master's in public health program. Uh, to build upon his research experience at Florida State. He was also uh, a volunteer with uh, uh, the, the EMT organization on campus. I'm going to space on the specific name of it, um, but had a lot of experience when it came to uh, public health. And so when he was looking at, um, and for the United Kingdom specifically, just to briefly touch on that, what you're going to see on their page is they predominantly have partnership awards, meaning uh, that there will be one Fulbright to this university. Uh, and that can be very broad, very open, meaning that if you want to go and study at that institution, you can find any eligible degree unless uh, otherwise noted. And so, uh, so, uh, so for, for his project, he found this partnership award at the University of Sheffield. Uh, and based on the research he had done uh, at FSU that focused on um, accessibility for uh, marginalized communities when it came to public health resources, he was able to, because uh, he knew he wanted to travel to the United Kingdom, but initially did not know Sheffield, but he was able to find a lot of research uh, that, had been, uh, that, that had been conducted and was still being conducted uh, in the city of Sheffield regarding their healthcare services. And so um, when he looked at everything all together and looked at the faculty uh, at the University of Sheffield, he started to build really great connections uh, with a faculty member there uh, from Ghana, which is where Charles actually did his, some of his research um, through, the, uh, through the Gilman Scholarship Program. 
Um, and so they were able to build that connection really quickly and to talk about uh, that juxtaposition between healthcare services between the United States, Ghana, and the United Kingdom, uh, but then was also able to look into the research that the city had been doing uh, and was able to focus on specific aspects so it, it, uh, that he wanted to study uh, for his thesis and his master's program. So collectively, he was looking at, this is not why I just want to study in the UK, but this is why I need to study at the University of Sheffield under the tutelage of this faculty member. Um, and so when we're thinking not just the research awards, when we're thinking about the academic Fulbrights, there are many different ways that you can establish the, okay, so why do I need to apply here and nowhere else? And so the United Kingdom just happens to be one of the most competitive countries to apply to. And so Charles and I were well aware of that going into the process. Um, so he was listed as a, as a semi-finalist, meaning he was one of the uh, like final four uh, students considered for this one fellowship. And while he didn't ultimately receive an offer, uh, he was able to uh, take that application because he were concurrently, we were also working on some of his graduate school applications domestically. Um, and he was able to use a lot of the essays uh, and components of the essays that he had written for Fulbright in some of his graduate degree um, applications and ultimately enrolled uh, at an NPH program at the University of South Florida that he just finished this past year. And so again, just to reiterate, that the end goal is, while we were disappointed that the Fulbright didn't work out, the fact that he was still accepted into graduate school with scholarship assistance is still like that. That's what we're, it's not always about the Fulbright. We want to make sure that you're pursuing opportunity and we make sure that you're giving yourself options after your undergraduate degree or after your graduate uh, uh, school can, uh, concludes. Um, and so, Application checklist, just to kind of go through all of these different components. Um, and so this is all of what you're going to, well, in some cases, it's not all, uh, but, uh, but this is most of what you're going to need to submit for the, uh, for the Fulbright Award. Uh, uh, if you're applying to a creative art Fulbright, uh, Fulbright, which is there's some intersection with the, uh, well, a lot of intersection with the academic branch, you do need to submit supplementary materials. But again, we can talk about that in a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Um, so the online application is pretty obvious, um, but I think uh, a lot of students come into it not knowing how extensive that online application is. Uh, it is an extremely deconstructed resume, and so you're going to need to be putting in all of your information, any publications or research experience that you have, all your work experience. Um, it, it's just, it's broken down pretty extensively, and so I always recommend to students to get started on that early because also there are um, not just the two essays that you need to write, but there are three or possibly four uh, short responses that you also need to write in the application that need to add nuance to your overall application. So the online application is extensive. Just make sure you don't wait until a couple of nights before to start working on that. Now, the two major components uh, that the majority of the work that we at ONF and OGFA are going to work with you on is going to be the statement of grand purpose and the personal statement. Uh, so you have three total pages to fully articulate or as fully as you can what your research project is, who you're working with, why you're applying to this specific destination, what you're going to be doing outside of your research project, either in terms of community engagement or cultural engagement or whatever that looks like, and to also tell me a little bit about your story and why uh, Fulbright is the, the, the logical next step for you in your professional or academic development. Um, and so the statement of grand purpose is two pages, single space. And even then, it's not a full two pages because three of those lines are committed to your heading, both on the first and second page. Uh, so you need to, so brevity is key here is what I'm saying. So we really need to early on establish why you're applying to the country that you are to as best as we can flesh out the details of your research uh, and, and articulate your affiliates. Um, and also uh, add in that, ex that extracurricular engagement, whatever that looks like relative to your project. With the personal statement, uh, even though you have one page, uh, I, I always tell my students that you have at most three quarters, most likely about half a page to give me a relevant anecdote or something about yourself that uh, that really connects to either the work that you're doing or the country that you're applying to. And then in the, in the last half of the last quarter of your essay, we need to tie it back. OK, so why Fulbright uh, or where do you where do you see yourself after this program? There's a few different right ways to do it, but we need to make sure that we're coming back to the opportunity at hand. 
The language evaluation, uh, for many countries, there is no language requirement. They just operate in English. Um, but for the countries that do require it, you need to make sure that you meet that minimum threshold. Uh, and so, is, for example, if you're applying to anywhere in Latin or South America, there's at minimum uh, an intermediate Spanish proficiency. If you're in the midst of taking classes right now, but wouldn't quite consider yourself intermediate, that's okay. Uh, if you're taking classes this semester or over the summer, uh, you can continue to work on that proficiency before you schedule an appointment uh, with somebody, uh, uh, somebody at Florida State that can evaluate your Spanish speaking skills. Um, but again, we can talk about that uh, in a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Um, and there's also a language self-evaluation in the application. Uh, if you have proficiency in multiple languages or maybe another language that is relevant to your research in the country that you're going to. Uh, but regardless, uh, we'll need to make sure that we get that filled out. Uh, the three letters of recommendation. Uh, obviously, for academic awards, academic letters uh, hold a lot of weight. Uh, so from people who have seen you as a researcher who can speak to your uh, your abilities in the classroom, when when relevant, uh, letters that can also speak to your character and your ability to engage across cultural differences are also valuable. Uh, but if you can have if you can aim for having three faculty members for Fulbright, that's not a bad thing to do, um, but I would say at least find two, uh, and then we can talk about the a relevant third. Um, and when we want to make sure that you start building connections with those recommenders early on, because I always tell my students that, um, especially if they're not in my from my academic background, is that we can sit down and review all your essays and your project all day long, but. I want to make sure that you're getting the technical review from your faculty to make sure that the aspects of your research that maybe I don't understand, uh, they're getting you good feedback on that. Um, so regardless, make sure that you're building those connections with faculty early uh, and letting them know that you're planning to uh, apply for a Fulbright because they may have uh, relevant connections that you also don't know about perhaps in country, which has happened many times in the past. The affiliation letters. Um, I'll say are consistently the hardest uh, piece for uh, students to to acquire. Uh, sometimes at no fault of their own, um, but you can submit up to three to any country. Um, three is not always best, um, but it's whatever is relevant for your project. Um, and so the affiliate affiliation letter essentially is um, either from an academic or a nonprofit or organization or some research entity or whatever it may be that's in country saying, Yes, we know they are applying. We will we will support them in X, Y, and Z ways, and we are really excited to work with them on their project uh, and print it on letterhead. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of nuance to that, but to give you a good example, um, I had a student a few years ago that uh, was applying for a, a film project in Germany, and the whole focus of their project was they were uh, there was this building that was being that was that was originally going to be torn down, but had been saved by this nonprofit organization that was looking at not just renovating the, the space, uh, but they were going to add apartments for uh, refugee community members to be able to you know, stay for at a, at a fair cost. Uh, they were also going to add uh, shops uh, to the store and they were gonna provide a free space for artists who wanted to come and create. So it was just gonna be this, this, this building that was going to be renovated and served as this collective community area. Um, and so they wanted to document not just the renovation aspect, but the community members and what brought them to these spaces uh, and, and don't need to get into much more detail than that. But the point is, um, when they were looking at their letters of affiliation for Germany, it was required that a letter of affiliation came from an academic entity. So some faculty members somewhere at some university is going to need to, need to support this project. And so uh, they were able to find uh, support from a nearby university, from a faculty member there. But they also got a, a letter of affiliation from uh, the people who owned this space uh, and a letter of recommendation, uh, I'm sorry, a letter of affiliation from the uh, from the nonprofit that was that was supporting them in this project. Uh, and so all three of those letters together provided a distinct aspect of their project and how they were going to be supported. So collectively, uh, it made the project more feasible, which is that one word that I would encourage you to write down and underline three or four times. Um, and so so anyways, when it comes to your project, we want to make sure that, uh, for example, 
um, regardless of what the research is, uh, sometimes students in their application will say like, oh, and I'll be using this library and their resources uh, to, to you know, either conduct a literature re review or to, uh, to really hold the documents that I am studying firsthand. Uh, and sometimes students don't think, well, have you reached out to that library to confirm with them that they're okay with you using their materials? Uh, but anyways, uh, this is the one, uh, the one piece of your application I would strongly encourage you to start thinking about now, start sending out some emails now, start talking to your faculty now, uh, so we don't come to the end of the summer and we're still just like, okay, so who are you working with? Um, I'll stop rant, uh, ranting about that. Uh, I feel like that's the one bullet point that is traumatic for me as well, because it's just, uh, it's always difficult. Um, but regardless, um, you need your transcripts from all um, universities that you have attended, uh, and don't forget to get your passport. Uh, and you can do that here at Florida State over at the stadium. Um, they can do that for you. Okay, uh, so components of a strong application. Uh, I've already kind of spoken ad nauseum about the commitment to Fulbright's mission, that mutual peace and understanding uh, between uh, the United States and the country that you're applying to, and in, in as many ways as possible, establishing that this is the best place for me to apply to based on my skill set, my interests, what I hope to get from this experience, but also what I just what I bring to this experience, they can really use that. Um, limited in-country experience is again on a case-by-case -case situation. Um, rarely do I, I work with a student that has too much. If you have been to that country previously and have done research, that's not necessarily going to preclude you from applying. Uh, I think you can use that in, in a very productive way in many cases. I think this is more so if you have been living in that country for like more than six months consecutively and you're applying to a Fulbright to extend your stay in that country, that's where it starts to get a little murky. Um, if you have dual citizenship between the U.S. and another country, nine times out of ten, that, that's going to uh, keep you from applying to that country. But in some cases, uh, in Mexico comes to mind. Um, having dual citizen, citizenship is never a problem, and sometimes that can be a little preferred. Uh, but uh, so limited country experience, um, the language proficiency. We've, again, we've already mentioned that you need to meet that minimum threshold. But like I already said, if the if the nature of your research and of your project really necessitates advanced uh, proficiency, then you're going to need to show how you're going to get that support. Um, but also, uh, if even if it's not required. Uh, sometimes Fulbright likes to see that you have either the intentions to learn in country or prior to your departure uh, to start studying the language just so you can engage a little bit more uh, seamlessly when you get there. Uh, I, a, a project that is country specific, again, I spoke about that ad nauseum, but um, sometimes I do have students that will sit down uh, and say, my, based on my research and my interests, both of these countries uh, are extremely relevant to what I want to do. You know, just how do I decide? Um, obviously, that's not a decision that I can make for you. Any of your advisors can't. Like, you really need to kind of dig deep for that. Um, but talk to your faculty about that, um, you know, and, and really try to reflect on what's the best uh, situation for you to be in relative to your future goals. Um, but more often than not, when you look at all the factors considered, uh, you can really start to pinpoint this is the right location for me. Um, obviously, feasible project, again, just to reemphasize. Uh, and we want your essays uh, to be both uh, authentic, to be relevant, and to be really compelling. And that's where working with OGFA or ONF can be really helpful. Uh, the selection process. Uh, so I kind of alluded to this earlier that it is a very long, I think perhaps longer than any other fellowship that we work with from the time that you start working on your application to the time that you submit your application to the time that you find out if you're a semifinalist or not to the time that you find out you are selected to then when you finally start your Fulbright, I uh, can be anywhere from a year to a year and a half. And so for right now, um, we're, we're firmly in the planning stage. Uh, so this June 1st deadline, uh, and we're going to have the links active uh, for these very soon. And we'll, if you're registered for this workshop, we're going to send those out to you. Um, but June 1st is the deadline for both uh, the intent to participate uh, and the project proposal. What the project proposal is, um, is uh, essentially first drafts of your essays. We're not looking for excellent drafts. We're just looking for your ideas so we can understand the direction that you're wanting to go uh, and how to best support you. 
And so we want to make sure that we get all of that submitted by June 1st, because then over the next few months, uh, we're going to be meeting uh, usually, and sometimes this can be different for graduate students, but usually we're going to be meeting once a week to review and edit your essays for us to provide you feedback and for you to take those, take that with you into the next week and to edit and to research and to read and to, you know, what you need to do. And then we meet again. So it's this wash, rinse, repeat cycle. Um, and the earlier we can get started on that process, the better. Um, it's it, because of the, the letters of recommendation take time, the affiliation letter takes time. And the essays, it's not something that you can just churn out, get them edited once, and then resubmit because of how much content you need to include in your essays. Uh, the writing process for this award can be uh, pretty new for a lot of applicants. Uh, and so that's why we, we want to get started as early as possible. Now, when you submit by the end of August, and so for the academic grants, it's going to be August, uh, August 25th. Uh, the reason why we have that deadline is because when you submit, and this will be going into your application and formally clicking the submit button, it's not as scary as it sounds because we can unsubmit your application, but still a little scary. Um, but you're going to submit your application so we can download a full and complete application. Uh, and the reason why the, we're aiming for a full and complete application is because you will sign up for interviews in uh, mid-September where you will be um, interviewed by uh, former Fulbrighters at FSU, faculty members at Florida State, um, uh, people from departments where we have heavy traffic of Fulbright applicants. And, and they're interviewing you to really uh, flesh out your application as best as possible to give some, some manageable feedback going into the last few weeks of the application cycle. Um, and in, in addition to that, and this is the benefit of applying through Florida State's process, is that one of those faculty members are going to write what is called your CCE form. It's your campus committee evaluation form. And it is uh, essentially uh, about one to one and a half pages where that faculty member uh, it, it formally endorses you as an applicant. So it's not just Florida State endorses this applicant, um, but it's uh, really giving more content that maybe you don't have space to write about in the, in the essays or in the little short responses uh, to really speak to your character, to speak to your motivations. Um, and, 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 and quite frankly, I read through, so we actually just got our semifinalist decisions yesterday. Uh, and so i uh, going through and rereading some of my students' applications because I'm nostalgic like that. Uh, I actually came across an affiliation, or I'm sorry, a CCE form that was the most glowing review that I've ever seen of a student that I have worked with. And so you better believe that I'm going to download that and use it as an example for uh, some of our faculty members. But that's going off on a tangent. But what I'm saying is um, at at worst, you get a thumbs up from the university. And at best, you get a thumbs up from the university. And it's just a, such a glowing review of you as an applicant that it really does hold weight at that uh, national review level. Um, so anyways, uh, so you interview with faculty at Florida State in mid-September. You get that feedback. And usually it's anywhere from about a week and a half to two weeks that you have to implement that feedback. Um, and so we've set our deadline is October 3rd. Uh, I, I think the national deadline is around October 8th or 10th. I'd have to go back and double check. Uh, but the reason why we have that early deadline is because once every applicant from Florida State University submits, we all need to go in and add the CCE forms to double check that everything is good to go, that there are no errors in your application, that the, you know, you've submitted all of your transcript components, you know, yada, 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 and that does take time. Um, but also at that point, we've usually been working on this application for like four to five months. And so is one or two more days really gonna make that much of a difference? Like that's why we wanna get started early so we can make sure your application is polished. And then after you submit for that early October deadline, uh, is the is, is the waiting period. Um, and, and so, like I said, we received notification yesterday. Um, so our applicants will find out tomorrow whether they have been uh, uh, pushed forward. Uh, so you're looking at the end of January. Uh, at best, it's end of December. Sometimes, depending on country, they'll release a few decisions here and there. But really, it's by the end of January that you're going to find out if you're a semifinalist or not. And then those applications are sent from the American Review Committee, which they're being reviewed by um, experts, in, if not in your specific country, of that region or of relevant fields in that region. But then it's uh, being sent to the host country to, to, to review. And so they're going to get the American Committee's ranking. 
Uh, and then they're going to make their selections uh, based on that. Uh, and so those decisions can come out anywhere from late February, but usually uh, it's going to be around uh, March uh, to uh, early April. And then after you find out you're selected, uh, then it's the, the orientation period over the summer and really planning for either that August or September start date or anywhere up until that January start date. Um, so again, it's, it's a very, very long process, but once that October 3rd deadline passes, for any student that I'm working with, I always recommend, okay, so what's next? Okay, so if you're applying, for example, for a, a Fulbright to an academic program, you also need to apply to that program, that your Fulbright does not count, so your Fulbright would be contingent on being accepted into that university. Um, but besides that, then it's like, okay, well, what other programs are you applying to? What other fellowships are you applying to? Because Fulbright is due so early, I think the benefit, one of the major benefits of going through the process beyond obviously receiving the Fulbright is that you're developing excellent essays and materials that can be modified and adapted to other fellowships that are due later in the fall or early spring. Um, and so I think there's a lot of benefits to the process beyond just the Fulbright itself. Um, so back to ONF and OGFA and how we can help you. Obviously, we can work through your projects with you, uh, not just the essays, but really making sure these are feasible ideas. Um, between uh, myself, Keith, and Bonnie, uh, and, and Dr. Stevenson and Dr. Filer, uh, you have years of experience and connections at Florida State University, both in terms of faculty and resources that can help you flesh out this project. Um, you also have, uh, through, through us, we have connections to Fulbright alumni, students that I've worked with uh, from the, back when I started as a graduate assistant in this office back in 2015, that have now either moved on to their graduate studies or have moved on to greater things. Um, but would love to talk to you about their Fulbright projects. Um, obviously, we help you manage the application. We work with you on uh, selecting the, pro the, the most appropriate affiliates uh, and recommendation letter writers for your project. Uh, we will also host workshopping um, or, or essay workshops. In the past, we have also partnered applicant with applicant to review materials. So we want to make sure we get as many eyes on your application as possible. Uh, and we also have contacts within Fulbright that we can always uh, recommend you to. Um, but uh, something that you can, okay, so after that, that was the, so this is just all of our contact information. Um, if you would like to write that down, if you're an undergraduate, reach out to either myself, Bonnie, or Dr. Filer. We also have Christine uh, that will be with us over the summer, our graduate assistant, uh, to provide support. Um, if you're a graduate, uh, a graduate student, reach out to Dr. Stevenson or Dr. McCall, um, and they would be, or Honorine, their graduate assistant, I don't know if she's going to be here over the summer, um, but, but they, would, they would be happy to help you. Um, and I'm more than happy to stay for as long as you have questions. Um, if you would like, I could also bring up the Fulbright website just to kind of briefly go over that. I don't think we have to record that portion, but, um, but we'd be happy to kind of show you how to navigate the website and some of the resources that are in that website as well. Um, so for those of you who do need to go, thank you so much for joining us today um, and listening to me ramble. Um, like I said, this is one of my favorite fellowships that ONF works with and OGFA works with. Um, and, it, and, and there's just really no limit to, the, uh, to what students bring to the table. Um, and so feel free to type into the chat uh, or you can unmute yourself and be happy to answer any questions.